Well, hello and welcome to our special live stream edition of Unbelievable. It's Thursday evening here in the UK. It's Thursday afternoon in the US where my guest is joining me from and I'll be introducing Kristin Kobes dumay in just a moment's time. But this is Unbelievable, the show that aims to get you thinking with conversations that matter. So glad to be joined on both our Facebook and YouTube channel tonight by Kristin. And uh, Kristin is a professor of history and gender studies at Calvin University and author of the best-selling book Jesus and John Wayne how white evangelicals corrupted a faith and fractured a nation now tonight uh, you are welcome to ask Kristin a question too you can do that by simply leaving a comment in the uh, questions area so well the comments area leave your question there uh, wherever you're watching from Facebook YouTube or whatever and uh, today's show will also feature on this weekend's unbelievable podcast if you want more podcasts, conversations and resources, then do check out our webpage at premierchristianradio.com forward slash unbelievable. And you can sign up to receive regular newsletters from us as well with bonus content. And all of those links are with today's show. But first of all, uh, may I say welcome along, Kristin, to the show. It's great to have you here. Um, so many people have been saying, when are you going to get Kristin Cobes dumay on your show, Justin? I'm glad we've been able to make it happen finally. So, yeah, so welcome. Thank you. How's... Thank you for having me. It's great to be with you. How's, how's life in Michigan at the moment? Life is, you know, we just keep keep managing. Uh, it's it's very hot and humid here right now. Kids are just back in school this week, which is great, but also, you know, lots of new school activities. And uh, our semester starts up on Tuesday, so it, things are picking up. Oh, and then, yeah, you know, I, COVID. We have COVID all over. Well, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so that too. Well, well, you you have had quite the the year, not just for those normal reasons that everyone's experienced, but because of this extraordinary book, which has been a runaway bestseller, Kristin, um, Jesus and John Wayne. Um, before we launch into the actual material of the book, were you expecting the kind of response it's had? Because I, th I think it's almost grown over the last year, really, that response, hasn't it? Yeah, you know, I, I get asked this question a lot. And up through like October, November, it was considered a really successful book. And when I would get asked this, I was like, yeah, I, I actually kind of thought it was a big book. I thought it, it it really spoke to the moment. I thought it would find its readers. Uh, I have a great publisher and, and I was pretty confident, you know, we had a nice premiere and uh, uh, debut on, on NPR. And so, yeah, things were kind of going as planned. Uh, what I didn't expect was for the momentum to just continue and increase, and um, particularly for its its popularity with white evangelicals themselves, that's something I I didn't anticipate, not to this extent. G given given that in a sense it's the white evangelicals who come in for some criticism, <laughs> I, I understand what you're saying, but but in a sense I suppose that's that's heartening that there's obviously a significant audience that wants to understand what's happening in this cultural moment and and obviously some of the criticisms that, that you have in the book about it but but when it comes to to the reason it's it's had this momentum what i mean even with you know in a sense trump now somewhat in the back mirror what why has it continued to grow in that way would you say Kristen? Yeah, well, you know, the book isn't really written uh, with white evangelicals as its primary audience. Um, the subtitle is a, a bit of a, a clue there. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it's it's not a book that's meant to woo evangelicals. And so, you know, I think I think it's it's uh, initial audience was primarily just the national audience. Uh, and and then it was it took a little time, I think, for a lot of evangelicals to realize, oh, we can read this book. <laughs> this this book is for us, too. And uh, it, it started to kind of make its way through evangelical spaces, uh, first through word of mouth and through this podcast network. So, you know, small podcasts, uh, conser often conservative uh, uh, white men uh, who who said, hey, you know, I, this, there's truth here. We need to talk about this. So it started this almost not quite underground movement, but um, kind of grassroots. And then some bigger names started uh, uh, talking about it. When Beth Moore tweeted about it, uh, I think that really um, gave a lot of people permission to say, oh, this is for us. And uh, mm -hmm. and we we do need to engage this and, um, and and so and then there's just the the larger political uh, backdrop right where we we had the 2020 election and then it was contested and it never seemed to end and then we had the events of January 6 and uh, you know those events uh, the um, storming the Capitol and uh, violence 
uh, that we saw, the Christian imagery, I think it just really confronted people, the enormity of the situation. And and this is a book that that speaks to all of those things. And mm. also it's a book that, um, because it's a book about popular culture, it was a book that I think uh, connected with ordinary evangelicals um, very intimately. So I get a ton of letters every day, and most of them start with some version of, this is the story of my life. And so I think it yeah. just connects intimately with readers. That's so interesting. Well, look, um, we're looking to connect with some listeners and viewers today um, on the show. Uh, because it's live, we can take questions. So if you're watching and you'd like to ask a question of Chris Kristin, whether you call yourself an evangelical or not, whether you're white or not, uh, you're welcome to, to be involved. And um, just put a comment, um, put a question or a comment in the comments box wherever you're watching this on Facebook or YouTube. And we'd be delighted to try and squeeze some of those in, in the second half of the interview today. So look forward to, to getting those. Uh, we're going to be talking about, obviously, the book, the thesis, um, evangelicalism. I think we should define that as well um, as part of this. Um, obviously, politics, Trump and so on uh, will all feature in the conversation. But recently, there's been a really interesting sort of podcast that's blown up and been in all of our social media feeds, the the rise and fall of Mars Hill, and, and we'll talk about that and Mark Driscoll and how that pa perhaps feeds into some of the what you're talking about in in the book as well. But but just before we get to all that, let's get to know you a little, Kristin. Um, so you teach history at, at Calvin University. Uh, Calvin, is that a, a primarily Christian university it out is. there in Grand Rapids? It is. Named after John Calvin, Dutch Reformed tradition. Uh, I'd say the majority of our students are white evangelicals. So, yes. And and I mean, in, in that sense, you you yourself are a Christian, Kristin. Yes. Um, it, have you ever worn that label evangelical? Or is that one you've tended to steer clear of yourself? Uh, so I've never really identified as an evangelical. I grew up in this Dutch Reformed subculture in a small town in Iowa. My dad was a, a ordained minister, theology professor, wrote his dissertation on Abraham Kuyper, if that means anything to you or your listeners. So, you know, in, in, a, in a subculture. And I, we didn't define ourselves as evangelicals. We defined ourselves over against American evangelicals, right? We were distinctive and we were a lot smarter than evangelicals were. <laughs> That's what I kind of grew up uh, assuming. And uh, so, uh, so yeah, I didn't um, personally identify as evangelical. That said, my denomination that I belong to, the Christian Reformed Church, is uh, part of the National Association of Evangelicals. And I did grow up very much enmeshed in evangelical popular culture. So I only listened to Christian music, shopped at a Christian bookstore. And so that popular culture that, that I, I give a lot of attention to here was very much a part of my upbringing. Yeah, it's... It, it's it, it's it's something that I think it, it is often helpful with these sorts of things. When we talk about evangelical, that can mean different things to different people, yes. can't it? Um, so how do you define it in the book? What what do you mean by evangelical? Some people will have a very theological label yes. for that. Others will have a very cultural label for yes. that. Where Where do you find yourself on that? Yeah, I'm a cultural historian, so I'm definitely more on the cultural side. Uh, you know, and I didn't actually intend when I started writing this book, I wasn't going to redefine evangelicalism. I had no interest in that. My plan was just to drop in the standard definition of evangelicalism that scholars always use, which is a theological one. And so essentially defines evangelicals according to their theological beliefs, things like uh, crucicentrism, the centrality of the cross, biblicism, the authority of the scriptures, conversionism this born again experience and then evangelism or activism and if you, you check those boxes you're an evangelical but as i was writing this book i just kept running up against that and realizing this doesn't capture what i'm actually describing and so i came to see evangelicalism in u.s history particularly the last half century 70 years or so as more of a, a cultural movement um, and less of a, a, a kind of theological rubric. And that's why I really emphasize this popular culture. Um, so um, it, it's not, are you a real evangelical or not by, you know, can you check all these boxes? In fact, the majority of people who self-identify as evangelicals um, aren't very theologically literate. Uh, in fact, many of them hold beliefs that could be counted as heresy. So, you know, theology just isn't at the center 
of what it means to be an evangelical. Uh, so instead, I, I talk about evangelicalism as a series of networks and alliances and as a consumer culture. How deeply are you enmeshed in that? Maybe you just dabble in it a little bit. Maybe you're all in. And that's how I treat evangelicalism. And so this book is really mapping that out, mapping out these alliances, describing these dis distribution networks, the cultural products, and, and then examining that kind of evangelicalism and where that takes us. Mm. So, so having defined evangelical, uh, as you use it in the book, at least, um, what, I mean, the book begins with, with Trump and, and indeed it, it came out obviously shortly before, you know, the election, obviously, which he lost ultimately, Yes. but, um, but you say that Trump isn't sort of some anomaly, yeah. uh, you know, and the fact that it, I don't know, what was it at the last election? Something like 75% of white evangelicals cast their vote in his favour. That yeah. That is not an anomaly, just an accident of history. What, give us the sort of the background to what you felt, you know, led up to this and, and what it's significant about it. Yeah. So, you know, around 2016, the big question was, you know, would white evangelicals support Trump? And then when that answer became clear, the next big question was, how could they? How could white evangelicals betray their values and vote for a man like Donald Trump, who seemed to stand against all of their values that they held most dear, right? Family values, evangelicals, the moral majority. And um, what I knew at that point, because I had already spent quite some time uh, examining evangelical views of masculinity, um, uh, particularly of this warrior masculinity, uh, it, I, I knew that uh, this uh, people who were asking this question didn't fully understand what evangelical values actually were and what was at the heart of family values evangelicalism. Historically, I knew that we had to place the assertion of white patriarchal authority at the heart of family values evangelicalism. And that's a, um, a vision of masculine leadership, of masculine heroism that champions uh, doing what needs to be done, champions, uh, you know, whatever the cost, uh, violence to achieve righteousness. And, um, and, and once you locate that kind of at the heart of ev the evangelical value system, then somebody like Trump makes an awful lot of sense. And this really came to me, by the way, I had um, 15 years ago already started researching evangelical masculinity and how it was an intertwined with militarism. And then I ended up setting that project aside, always meaning to come back to it. And it was in the days after the release of the Access Hollywood tape um, in October of 2016, when we saw evangelicals, um, you know, briefly briefly waver in their support of Trump when we had this, you know, him on video bragging about assaulting women. And then within the week, they were all back um, supporting him. And that's when it clicked for me that, you know, we've seen this before. We've seen this so many times before. And if we had been properly listening to the rhetoric around um, evangelical manhood and heroism and um, really ruthlessness uh, and understanding this, this militancy uh, at the heart of evangelicalism, then then this just shouldn't come as a surprise at, at, mm. at all. I, I mean, just sticking with Trump for a minute, though, obviously, the book is about far more than just Trump. Yeah. Um, a, a lot of British evangelicals on this side of the pond were very confused, concerned when, you know, there, there was this outpouring of support for Trump. Mm -hmm. um, but then as I spoke to a lot of my friends and colleagues in the US who had voted Trump, um, a lot of them at the time, this is, you know, back in 2016, said, well, he was, the, you know, the better of two bad <laughs> alternatives yes. and so on. So th this was frequently the, the reason given, you know, yes. and that obviously you know, the Democrat Party, Clinton in particular, and, and latterly Biden, you know, stood for all kinds of things that they couldn't possibly sanction around mm -hmm. abortion, and LGBT and, you know, issues around the family and so on. And and that was the reason why. And and yes, Trump was in a sense, a strong character, but a lot of them said, well, maybe we need a strong character at this time, even if you don't like his manners, you know, we're going to hold our nose and we're going to vote for the guy who actually is actually instituting what obviously they believe are Christian mm -hmm you know policies in the country or more likely to at least um so what's what's your response to that because mm -hmm. people aren't going to say no we 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 weren't looking for a bully or a strong yeah. man we were looking for someone who would represent us at, at the ballot box and and a lot of them would say well that's what he did in the four years he was there as well 
Yeah. Well, you know, first, some absolutely said we're looking for a bully, except they wouldn't use quite that terminology. They, you know, he's our ultimate fighting champion. He's going to protect us. And he's God's anointed who was given to us precisely because he is so ruthless and he will be ruthless on our behalf. So, so there was a lot of that rhetoric actually in 2016 and, and continuing. Um, but also I would, I would suggest that we need to look more closely at uh, evangelical support during the primary season, uh, that if white evangelicals had not supported Trump throughout the primaries, he would not have been the nominee, right? And that isn't to say that the majority of evangelicals supported him, but we had a whole slew of candidates, right? Uh, but uh, early on, already in 2015, you were seeing not at the leadership, not top down. It took a while for them to get on board, but this grassroots support uh, already in, I think, August of 2015, we saw those numbers and it was getting media attention. And so white evangelicals were choosing him above the other slate of candidates. Um, and that only increased with time. The more they got to know him, the more he appeared on that primary stage, the more he was, uh, you know, making himself known. And he was, he was like, unlike any candidate we'd ever seen before, you know, he was just absolutely unrestrained uh, and, and completely broke all the rules. And the more he did that, the more evangelicals came to back him. So yes, the narrative was Hillary Clinton. You know, we couldn't possibly vote for Hillary Clinton. You have to hold your nose and vote for Trump. And that is absolutely true for some people. But their enthusiasm for Trump did not wane once Hillary Clinton was safely defeated, right? And that's where you can see the survey data throughout his four years as president continued to be, uh, you know, white evangelicals, his stalwart supporters, far and above the, you know, support of any other demographic through thick and thin, didn't matter what happened. And so this whole nose holding theory um, doesn't hold a lot of water. And then there's the fact that, okay, policy wise, again, any Republican candidate would uh, be, you know, standing for those same policies. And, and Trump is the one that they wanted when they had a chance to impeach him and, you know, get, get, um, you know, Pence, one who is truly one of their own. Uh, there was absolutely no desire to have Mike Pence in that role. They wanted Trump. So where, where did this desire, as you see it, for this strong kind of almost, you know, bullying kind of yeah. approach uh, come from? Uh, and, and just again, it'll still have to be the really, you know, boil down version of this, <laughs> Christine, because of time. But, yeah. but where, where does that culture come from? Where did you trace it back to historically? Well, I, I really emphasize the signif significance of the Cold War era when this kind of militant faith uh, made a lot of sense in, in the Cold War context. Uh, communists were anti-God, they were anti-family, they were anti-American, and they were an active military threat. So they needed a strong military defense. And and this is where you know Christian nationalism really comes to the fore as well. This idea that America is a Christian nation and it has to be defended as such, defended militarily, and the centrality of Christianity has to to be defended against domestic enemies as well. And so that's that's really the strand that I pull through. And this is a then a, a kind of militant faith where uh, it thrives on the relationship between militancy and fear. When I started off this project, I thought that militancy was really a response to fear. All right, they're they're afraid of communists. They're afraid of you know fill in the blank, and therefore they they we see this militancy. What my research showed me is we need to flip that script. More often than not, it was the militancy that came first, and you see leaders pastors, political leaders actively stoke fear in the hearts of their followers in order to consolidate their own power. So the militancy often came before the fear. That's that's really interesting. Um, in terms of the sort of where that's brought us to, as it were now, I mean, when you go to the average American, I mean, there are outliers, obviously, but the average American megachurch, evangelical megachurch, you, you, what you'll find there is something very welcoming, not something threatening or militaristic, normally, at least. So so how does this play out? I mean, is it more at the kind of the subculture level, the, the kind of area of, of, of politics and, and power and that kind of thing, rather than what you get maybe on a Sunday in a sort of, I don't know, 
Joel Osteen's, you know, church in, <laughs> in Houston or wherever. Yeah, what I would say is you know, you'll actually get a mix. You'll get a mix at many okay. churches um, because, you know, you walk in the doors, you will absolutely be welcomed because that's evangelism, right? Come join us. Come be one of us. Come share our values, right? Now, the, the reception could change a little bit if you start to challenge some of those values, if you start to say, well, what about this or what about that? But you're going to absolutely encounter this, this friendly reception. Uh, you're going to hear a lot of praise music, right? It's going to seem like quite, you know, light and fun and welcoming and warm. Um, and at the same time, you know, what? Uh, take a look at what the men's ministry is up to. And why do they have a separate men's ministry and a separate women's ministry? And look at this kind of gender breakdown and what, what sorts of values are they promulgating? And in the men's ministry, you're, you're likely going to get some of this kind of um, uh, rhetoric. Uh, extremely popular, millions of copies of the books uh, that I write about, uh, about the, uh, that are advancing this militant Christian manhood, have been sold, have been read, have been studied together as the word of God. Uh, um, so, so this culture really does permeate American evangelicalism. And it's not that you have this kind and gent gentle version or this more militant version. This militant version is cloaked with this kindness and this sweetness and this evangelism, but then scratch beneath the surface and you're going to find this political agenda and you're going to find these values in many mainstream evangelical churches there's there's obviously something attractive about that though for a number of people i mean and and obviously we, one of the things i wanted to talk to you about is is the rise and fall of mars hill this yeah. podcast from christianity today um uh, which mike cosper has done an amazing job mm -hmm. at hosting and producing i've been glued to it whenever it's come out and you've featured on several of the episodes yourself, Kristin. But but there, you know, it's telling the story of Pastor Mark Driscoll, who, you know, back in the 2000s was on everyone's timeline as well. Um, and and for those who aren't familiar, founding pastor or one of the founding pastors of Mars Hill, a, a mega church in Seattle, rose to great heights of popularity, but was increasingly criticised for his brash, some would say authoritarian bullying style resigned from the church in 2014 and the church itself closed down shortly afterwards which perhaps suggests how dependent they were on on mark himself on the platform um i've got some of my own stories to tell of mark driscoll actually which which maybe we'll come to later but 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 obviously he drew a massive crowd and yeah. was incredibly phenomenally popular yeah. on um you know podcast and video and everything else so so and uh, so a lot of people do rally to that very sort of strong yeah. Yeah. masculine form of christianity what's the attraction why why is it so popular then chris yeah you know i talked to a lot of men who had fallen under the sway of pastors like mark driscoll and john piper and others and you know i heard a variety of different stories but many men really liked being told that they were powerful, that they could be powerful. Um, and these weren't men who were like power hungry. You know, often these were like younger men, um, teenagers, 20 somethings who didn't really have their life together maybe, or, or felt like there was something more out there. Uh, and, and then they were told, you are a leader. All you need to do is step up and accept that leadership role. You are called to be strong. You are called to be courageous. Like there's some good stuff there, right? Um, now it, it, be, it becomes a little bit more, um, 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 suspect when it is highly gendered uh, because women also kind of like to have a purpose. <laughs> women like to be called to step up and be courageous and be strong. But, you know, in, in this whole system, women were not called to that. Women were called to step back. Women were called to be the beauty to be rescued, to be the passive, you know, uh, sidekick of the hero in the story who is the man. But I think for many men, it, um, it provided uh, a sense of purpose. And then the community also for people who were directly under his leadership in Mars Hill. Um, some were coming from um, you know, unchurched backgrounds. They didn't know that this wasn't you know business as usual. Others were coming from uh, different spaces, but Mark looked really cool. He looked really hip, and you know he um, he he provided community, but then um, had very strict rules for staying in that community. And all of this was preached in terms of God's will and in terms of ultimate truth. And anything outside of that closed space was of the enemy, even the church down the road. You go there, your theology could become wrong and you could be uh, damned for all eternity, right? And so the stakes were so incredibly high. It was great to be a part of that in some ways, but it was also, there was so much pressure to stay absolutely loyal. It's, 
I want to come to a question actually on masculinity from from someone um, and, and I just want to remind anyone watching that if you'd like to ask a question this is your opportunity uh, from here on in we'll be asking as many questions as we can of Kristin um, uh, you can do that by leaving a question in the comment where wherever you're watching on Facebook or YouTube um, just for those who aren't familiar with the book Kristin could you show us the cover of the book sure. I know you've got one to hand I there do. you are Jesus Jesus and John Wayne, how white evangelicals corrupted a faith and fractured a nation. Now, welcome to, to ask um, the tough questions of Kristin. I'm sure there are many people watching who maybe don't agree with every every aspect of, of Kristin's perspective on this, but we'd be happy to hear from you, whatever your thoughts are. Um, Grace wants to know, um, I'm curious, Kristin, what positive aspects of masculinity did you see in your research, if any? So what should evangelicals keep? Mm hmm. First, let me say that there are many different evangelical masculinities at play. In fact, um, my first draft of the proposal for this book, I had wanted to include, include an entire chapter on alternative evangelical masculinities and how this played out both in terms of race and in terms of, you know, more of the servant leadership variety and so on. Um, what I ended up, at, that got cut at the editorial stage of uh, <laughs> saying, that's great for an academic book. This is a trade book. Uh, just pull, you know, pull one thread all the way through. Um, but uh, uh, this particular more militant conception of masculinity, again, I think it does um, give people who might, um, you know, lack direction, uh, a, a challenge, a challenge to step up, to be responsible, to kind of take charge of, of their lives. I think um, often, again, the kind of 20 something young men in, in this uh, society where it can be hard to find uh, secure employment, where there's this kind of prolonged adolescent phase, it can um, be good to be told to step up and accept responsibility. But I actually have a very hard time identifying good things that don't have a, a shadow side that outweighs the good. Because as soon as you're saying this is just for men, and then then it warps some of these good things. Uh, you know, why why is it that this is just if, if men are the ones who are called to lead, where does that leave women? And what does that justify in terms of you know behaviors and so on that that can be condoned um, because, well, uh, they're called to lead. So I, I do have a hard time finding really good things that I, I don't have to immediately say, but but there's a darker side when you impose the stark gender difference where masculine and feminine are perceived to be opposites absolute opposite. So then the good that is, is given to like masculinity is taken from uh, women in the same spaces. I, I, I mean, there has been this phrase, hasn't there? Toxic masculinity has, yeah. has been a phrase, you know, used a lot in the last few years. And unfortunately, it's become one of those rather loaded terms because, you know, some people roll their eyes as soon as they hear it and say, oh, yeah. no, here's another woke, woke, wokeism. Um, others, others think there is a genuine problem with, you know, toxic masculinity. Um, what what for you is, I don't know, is is there a a right, a biblical, if you like, form of masculinity that that is modeled in scripture that you would say, mm -hmm. no, if you're looking to be, quote unquote, masculine, then, then mm -hmm. this is the model you should be approaching rather than the, I don't know, the, the Mark Driscoll version or whatever it might be. Yeah. So it, interesting that you say that. I don't use the phrase toxic masculinity anywhere in the book, uh, by the way. That was a very intentional choice because it means it means things to certain people and it's completely alienating yeah. to, to others. I thought it was kind of a lazy move, so I, I didn't go there. Uh, but uh, yeah, uh, is, is there is there a biblical masculinity? Um, what should who should men look to? I mean, the Bible is really complicated, right? I mean, pick a guy in the Bible apart from Jesus, and it's going to be a flawed, a flawed model. So I, um, I tend to want to step back from that question uh, because I think that question has been, it, it, in some ways, that question reflects this history that I've traced. Um, that there has to be a biblical manhood, a, a Christian masculinity that is held up. Uh, for all men to pattern their lives after, instead of thinking more broadly, what does it mean for each individual person, men and women, to follow Christ? Because God has created people with so much diversity in all sorts of ways, uh, both in terms of gender, but really everything, giftedness, personalities. I mean, there's just so much diversity in creation. And, and we are all given one model 
really. We are all called to follow Jesus Christ, women and men to follow Jesus Christ. So I think we should be asking much more, what does it mean for each of us as we are created, as we are made, uh, you know, as we find ourselves to pattern our lives after Jesus Christ. And that might look different for, you know, there's not one model that we aspire to. There's not, you know, you gotta, you, you gotta be able to climb a rock wall and shoot, you know, venison and, you know, and then you, know, you check those boxes, you're good. Um, yeah, that's just so uh, artificial. It's so culturally uh, positioned and it really doesn't fit most men. I mean, just sticking with masculinity, few people seem to be what want to sort of get 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 more thoughts on this. Um, uh, Callum says um, there's been a few episodes on Unbelievable talking about a crisis of masculinity in the past. How much do you think there has been this so-called crisis of masculinity, Kristin? What, what's yes, your thoughts I love on that? this question. Historians love this question because historians can point you to many, many periods in time where a crisis of masculinity was suddenly discovered, right? So then we, we are trained to ask particular questions. Uh, first of all, it's important to realize that masculinity is connected to economic shifts. Masculinity is connected to things like foreign policy. Masculinity is race specific, it's class specific. And so what, what we do then is we look at when, when people start talking about uh, or inventing a crisis of masculinity in any particular moment, we start to look at, okay, what's changing here? Why did the old patterns that were largely agreed upon, not, not, not uh, you know, perfectly agreed upon, but the dominant ideas of manhood, why do those stop working in a certain moment? And why do they suddenly need to be renegotiated? That's the crisis. And so rather than seeing like everything's great, everything's static and all of a sudden crisis moment, history is all about constant change over time. Uh, so the crisis of masculinity right now, we could point to a number of different things. Uh, if we look at, you know, race specific uh, causes uh, among, uh, for, among white people, there's often a sense of uh, feeling a, a kind of moment of racial threat or racial decline and then needing to assert white manhood or white Christian manhood in response. That can be part of it. Economics are really important here. As the economy is changing, as the breadwinner um, economy, particularly in the 1970s, 1980s, started to give way, which, by the way, in and of itself was a relatively recent development, this uh, breadwinner uh, masculinity, right? But when that started to become less tenable, we see this crisis of masculinity when the nature of work changes from working with your hands and producing to being more middle management. Am I even a man anymore, right? All of these things are going to make people feel like there is a crisis uh, because things are changing. I've got another question here also on, on the masculinity thing. This is an interesting, quite, quite specific one um, and uh, might maybe need some explanation for, for those who haven't heard of this movement, especially on this side of the pond. Um, but uh, Peter says, I was quite surprised by the antipathy, antipathy that some evangelicals such as Mark Driscoll had towards promise keepers. Yes. <laughs> how widespread was that? So just to explain what promise keepers is and how it links into this whole discussion on masculinity here. Yeah, promise keepers was a, a really big movement, the evangelical men's movement in the 1990s. Uh, it, it, it was headed up by um, uh, Bill McCartney and uh, he was a football coach and he decided that there was a crisis in American masculinity and American Christian masculinity and he was going to solve that. He called uh, thousands of men together to gather Gather together in stadiums and to keep their promises, to lead their families, to, to take on that role of servant leadership. And um, so at the time in the 90s, like, you know, feminists would look at this and, and, and many liberals, progressives like this is this is terrible. This is, you know, the religious right radicalized. And and in fact, it was it was it was more moderate than what had come before and certainly than what would come after. It was this kind of uh, soft patriarchy. Uh, so so, yes, you need to lead, but you need to be nice about it. And um, and this, this kinder, gentler model, tenderness. And so this is where we have the tender warrior motif. Um, this is where men would come together and be told, you, know, you can be emotional. You should hug each other. Uh, this is, uh, you know, uh, a new way to be a Christian man. 
And uh, that was great until it wasn't. By the late 1990s, there's this uh, growing backlash against that. Things had gotten a little too soft, a little too tender. And so you see the pendulum swing back towards a more aggressive, muscular Christianity. And so you see books come out like John Eldridge's Wild at Heart, James Dobson's Bring It Boys. That's all about testosterone is the key to masculinity. God is a warrior God and men are made in his image. Every man is a battle to fight. And then uh, 9-11 happens, 2001. All these books are newly on the shelves. And this vision of, a, of a, um, a real militant masculinity resonates across American evangelicalism and beyond. So that older model of promise keepers just feels in their mind, toxic, right? It, it's just way too soft. Things had gone way too far, way too effeminate, even though they were still upholding patriarchy. And we need we need to regain. And so Promise Keepers rebrands in the early 2000s, not your daddy's PK. All right, we're going to storm the gates. And they, they have all this militaristic imagery. And that's kind of this, again, change over time that we see. Right. It, it, it's really interesting isn't it, to see the way that these things have sort of developed over, over the years. Um, obviously, the story of Mark Driscoll is also the story of, of effectively the fall of a pastor. Now, not perhaps for all the typical reasons, sadly, in a way that, that right. pastors are often falling, right. which frequently do involve issues, yeah. you know, sexual misdemeanors and uh, abuse in congregations and, mm -hmm. and that sort of thing. Um, but why? I mean, it feels like everything's come together uh, in the last few years. Yeah. You've had, obviously... A very political dimension to a lot of evangelicalism in the US. Plus, you've had all these very high profile falls of significant ministries and pastors in them. Um, I, I mean, how do, are these linked? What's what's your diagnosis, if you like, yeah. for, for all of that, Kristin? Yeah. So when I first started paying attention to this topic in the early 2000s, uh, you know, I started looking at people like Driscoll and he just seems so extreme. And so I had this question, you know, what's 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 fringe here and what's actually, you know, mainstream and, and is this even worth my attention? And yes, he sold four or, or, you know, like people like John Eldridge sold four million copies of his Wild at Heart, but still it feels kind of fringe. You know, how do I, how do I tease this out? So I ended up setting the project aside for a long time. Um, but I didn't stop paying attention to all of these proponents of militant masculinity. And what I saw in the ensuing decade was one after another of these guys become embroiled in abuse uh, abuse situations, abuse of power, um, sexual abuse, either directly as perpetrators or indirectly supporting their friends who were perpetrators. And, and so I, I just had my eye on this for a very long time. And I knew when I decided to write this book in the fall of 2016, I knew this needed to be a part of the story. I knew it needed to be a chapter in the book. In fact, one of the first things I did was um, consult a lawyer because this was pre me too, when I started working on this book. And so the stories were largely living on blogs and survivor testimonies. And they weren't yet, they hadn't yet kind of hit the, the mainstream media. Um, and, um, but I knew this needed to be a part of, of the story because I saw how time and again, this abusive leadership was uh, justified and protected by these evangelical communities that they would, uh, you know, when these, when, when stories came to light, Almost every single case that I looked at, uh, they would uh, the community would end up defending the perpetrator, the pastor, the leader, and blaming the victim and just further traumatizing the victims. And this was such a repeated pattern. I came to see how uh, evangelical teachings, not just on masculinity and this kind of militant leadership style, testosterone, boys will be boys kind of thing, but also teachings of sexuality, that it's always the woman to, to who, who will be blamed if a, if, if um, there's a, a situation of sexual misconduct. It's always on her. But these teachings went way back. And when I took a close look at these teachings, they were far worse than I ever imagined. And I came to see how teachings of sexuality, how of female subordination, of masculine leadership and power all came together to create the situation that we find ourselves in right now. There's a few people in the comments and the question sort of wondering whether it's, you know, whether we're putting too much weight here on the, the masculinity thing. Um, mm -hmm. For instance, um, here's one who says, uh, if I can find it now, um, that it's, it's not a case of toxic masculinity, but toxic humanity, you know, isn't it both both sexes, if you like, that, yeah. that, that are at play here. 
and um and and so on i mean and and another person asking you know how would you describe the masculinity of jesus what's what for you is yeah. you know i i suppose obviously everyone is flawed everyone is fallen and so on why particularly do you feel that this is a problem of, of masculinity rather than, than rather than you know fem femininity or, or or any other issue well, uh, full disclosure, my next book is on Christian femininity. So <laughs> I'll have plenty to say on that too. And I do have a chapter on uh, 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 femininity and, and Jesus and John Wayne as well. So there's much more to be said. Also, I am a Calvinist, so I'm totally cool with everybody being fallen. You know, sin is not, you know, uh, uh, you know, women don't get a pass. But if you look at American evangelicalism, if you are all familiar, if you spent any time in these spaces, if you've read any of the literature, you're going to know that the way evangelicals talk about sin is highly gendered. The way evangelicals talk about humanity is highly gendered, right? So you've got books on, on how to be a Christian man, books on how to be a good wife. You've got, you know, it's just, it's just you know, as James Dobson has said, um, men and women are different in every cell of their bodies. And like I said, by different, it means opposites. So what we see happening then are things like, you know, talk about, you know, humanity, um, what it means to follow Christ. Um, you know, let's talk fruit of the spirit, love, joy, you know, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, self-control. These things are all feminized. These virtues are considered feminine. So that's great for the ladies. Um, courage, boldness, right? Violence when needed. That's what it is to be a Christian man. Now, obviously, like all of these things, there can be a virtue and, you know, certainly courage, boldness. Uh, if that's separated from love, joy, peace, right? Then that's where we have the ingredients for these toxic situations. And so in evangelicalism, this stark division of the genders, and then what we, and, and then this emphasis of, you know, the, the kind of warrior masculinity for men ends up in fact, transforming their image of Christ himself. Uh, because it, the question I think you, you're posing that, you know, Jesus of the Gospels, uh, as I, as a Christian, as I understand Jesus, what was most radical about the Christian faith is here we have God becoming man, divesting himself of power, offering sa himself as a sacrifice, right? The suffering servant. And that is the Christ that we are called to follow. And that is hard. <laughs> we are not wired for that. That is countercultural. It goes against our design. Again, I'm a Calvinist. Uh, but that's what we aspire to be. But in, in this whole discourse of Christian manhood, this warrior masculinity, it's the opposite. Um, and, and so, so I think we have to talk about masculinity, um, uh, and, 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 and because I, it's about Christianity. I, I've heard sort of almost the opposite argument though. And I'll give you my, my Mark Driscoll story here at this okay. point, Christine, which is that, um, back in, uh, the end of 2011 or early 2012, when he was promoting his real marriage book, obviously when he was, you know, still in, still in the public spotlight. Um, I did an interview with Mark uh, about the book, but also a sort of profile interview for uh, a fairly large Christian magazine here in the UK. It's sort of the British equivalent of, of Christianity Today, um, Premier Christianity magazine. And um, we, you know, I obviously asked him some of those questions about his, you know, uh, tone and some of the controversies and the things he says on Twitter and that sort of thing. Um, and I pushed back. I tried to be a good journalist, you know, in terms of, of you know, getting some some questions and answers in there from him um and we ended up talking about women in ministry and and i kind of um dropped she sort of dropped in at the end that actually my wife is a, a minister um and in ministry and uh and he kind of took this as a sort of almost i think he, he took it as i sort of you know tried to one up him or something and and he turned the tables on me and the, the interview finished with him grilling me about my theological beliefs and this sort of thing and one of the things he said in the course of that was that he didn't think um a woman could lead a church not just for theological reasons but because he believed a woman couldn't attract men and he asked me how many men go to your church what kind of men go to your church and i was sort of well men you know all kinds of men go to my church um but um but he obviously felt that and, and i've heard this from people not just mark driscoll this this sense that you've got to have men at the front to attract men if the men come the women will come with them mm -hmm. um and 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 a lot of talk about, uh, from people saying the church is too feminized you know it's all love songs to jesus it's all yeah. you know fuchsia and pastels and it's it's and and men don't 
come because it doesn't appeal to them in that kind of way. Yeah. So I think I think that that has, you know, whether it's Mark Driscoll saying it or not, a lot of people have felt like, oh, there is a problem of femininity in the church. Mm -hmm. We're too feminized and so on. Now, yeah. you know, I don't believe that myself because, uh, uh, you know, I think actually it's extraordinary to see the way that God uses in my opinion, both men and women uh, mm -hmm. to, to draw people. But there is obviously a camp who believes that actually men are best placed to do that. What's what's your feeling on that, Christine, that particular kind of argument? Yeah, you know, I, I would agree with with parts of it, uh, certainly. Um, but I would also say that here we're almost working with these essentialist conceptions of masculinity and femininity, that love songs to Jesus and pastels and fuchsia are what we ladies love. Um, let me tell you, it doesn't do it for me either. Not at all. Right. That's not the Christianity I'm looking for. That's really a product of this, um, you know, consumer Christianity that people have made specific choices, evangelicals in particular, to market Christianity to women in this way and to men in that way, right? And so, uh, yeah, you had um, people like Mark Driscoll who are saying men have to lead the church and we have to make it like war, we have to make it militarized and to, to attract the men and then the, the women, it doesn't really matter, they'll, they'll come along one way or another. Um, or um, on the other hand, you know, I'm, I'm researching Christian femininity right now and I've seen how in terms of Christian radio, uh, when women were identified as the primary consumer, uh, music was pitched to what they thought women wanted. And there we get all these love songs for Jesus kind of thing, right? And so this is really a product of um, um, essentialist ideas of gender that I would, as a feminist scholar, want to deconstruct and situate culturally and religiously and the product of this consumer Christianity. So I would be a big fan of deconstructing both of those, this masculinized version uh, that distorts Christianity and the quote unquote feminized version that also distorts Christianity and try to offer something better. By the way, if anyone's interested in hearing that that interview, we're going to put it out again in light of the the fact that this yeah. Rise and Fall of Mars Hill podcast has been of such great interest lately. Um, because the interview is nearly ten years old now, um, wow. uh, but we're, we're gonna we're gonna put it out on our classic replay edition of our podcast this coming week. So, That's so awesome. look out for that. If yeah, if you're an unbelievable listener, that expect that in your podcast. And um, which leads me to say, actually, we're, we're we're heading up to just the last fifteen minutes of the show. So now is a good time to get your final questions in. Um, and I'm going to continue to read some out as we as we draw up to the top of the hour. Uh, if you want more from Unbelievable, by the way. Uh, you can get hold of the podcast, you can get hold of shows, resources and more at our website. The link is with today's uh, program, wherever you're watching, premierchristianradio.com forward slash unbelievable. And you can subscribe to the newsletter there as well. And we've been talking about Kristin Kobes Dumay's book, uh, Jesus and John Wayne. Just flash the cover for us again, if you would, Kristin, just so people know what to look out for. Um, there's a link to Kristin's website from today's show as well, where you can find more details about the book. Um, questions here from Stephen over on the Facebook page, Kristin, who says, um, do you differentiate between different definitions of evangelical? And we, we talked about this a bit at the mm -hmm. beginning, but theological versus cultural. Mm -hmm. Steve, Stephen says it seems dangerous not to, lest we conflate individuals with a group they may not belong to. Um, uh, any thoughts on how this confusion affects our cultural interactions in society at large? And there's another one here as well, which which I'll, I'll ask as well. And and how do you conclude that militancy came before fear, as opposed mm -hmm. to the fear was already there and leaders simply tapped into it? So, a couple yeah. of questions. Yeah, is 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 it? Are you? Is it? Are we potentially tarring people with the one too broad a brush with the evan mm -hmm. evangelical thing if we don't take into account their their actual beliefs and so on? Yeah, so you know, I think actual beliefs do matter. I I think uh, self identification matters a lot too. I I just think that beliefs go far beyond a narrow uh, conception of you know this this rubric of um, you, you know crucicentrism, biblicism, things like that. I want to scratch beneath the surface. You talk about biblicism. What are we talking about really? Um, a lot of Christians will claim, hey, I take the Bible seriously too, right? So so biblicism. What are you talking about? Which let, let's let's get a little bit more specific. Um, you know, which Bible passages are key to faith and life in the evangelical community, in the white evangelical community in particular? And how does that differ from, say, black Protestantism? Because in, here, here's another example. If you take that theological rubric, the vast majority of black Protestants in America check all of those boxes. 
the vast majority of Black Protestants in America do not identify as evangelicals because it is very clear to them that there is a lot more to being an evangelical than checking those boxes, right? And so that's where I would say um, self-identification is important and participation in this broader culture that I map out. Um, and, and so uh, that said, I've also written in other places quite a lot about these kind of warring definitions of evangelicalism. I'm not saying that mine is the only only legitimate definition. Uh, but what I try to do is say, um, pay attention to who gets to define evangelicalism and then how they're defining it. So the, the theological rubric is the preferred definition among evangelical scholars, scholars who are themselves evangelicals, so evangelical intellectuals, among the leaders intellectual leaders of evangelicalism because they claim and for them they firmly believe it is a theological movement right i'm a cultural historian i'm going to bring a different toolkit here now they can ask their they can use their rubric and ask their questions and answer some interesting things and it's and then it's going to come up short to answer other questions as a cultural historian i'm bringing this toolkit it's going to help me answer some questions and it's not going to answer others and so i'm i'm not saying this is the one and in fact i don't even call this a definition of evangelicalism, it's a description of who I'm talking about and why I'm talking about these people in this way. I'm not going for a timeless definition whatsoever. There's a second part to your question. That, that, yeah, the second question that Stephen also had um, was was the whole issue of militancy and fear and so on as a driving force. Oh yeah, force. which comes first. And, and, and yeah, yeah, militancy or fear or was it already yeah. there and, and it's yeah, just yeah, being yeah. tapped into? Yeah, let me say that when I when I say that in many cases, the militancy came first, I was thinking of very specific situations, right? And I want to say that the fear that is generated <clears throat> is real, right? It is legit. This is even as it's manufactured, as it's stoked. Like I've talked to so many people who are very, very afraid as evangelicals, feeling like, you know, their religious liberties are going to be stripped from them any day. They're going to be coerced into doing things that they, they you know, their their conscience will allow them to do. Um, uh, where this really came clear to me, again, very specific examples, uh, was in the rhetoric, uh, the Islamophobia that, that um, we saw in the wake of 9-11. And what I came across there is I have this whole chapter that, that's really bizarre about these fake ex-Muslim terrorists. Um, that were all the rage on the evangelical speaking circuit. These guys who claimed to be former Muslim terrorists who converted to evangelical Christianity, and they went around to tell evangelicals how dangerous Muslims were and that they were targeting Americans, American Christians, and American evangelicals, especially because they were the most faithful Christians. And these guys were enormously popular, and they were all frauds. Not only were they frauds, but evangelical organizations continued to promote them, champion them long after they well knew that they were frauds. That's a point where I thought, what is going on here? Because the average evangelical was very afraid of the threat of Islam. And they were because that had been a fear that had been actively manufactured, right? Which doesn't mean there's not like, we all live in fear, we're all afraid of different things that that like, every single instance, uh, you know, fear came second. But in many of these situations, we see that this is a strategy. Another interesting question here, just trying to fit in as many as we can uh, with the rest of our time, Kristin. Uh, Joey asks, um, many supporters of the masculinity that Kristin argues against will point to passages such as Jesus overturning the tables in the temple. Favorite. Um, how do you see how do you see passages such as that? Um, does that count as militancy in, in your yeah. mind, Kristen? Yeah, you know, there's a place for anger. There absolutely is. What I'll say is that's the passage and then the book of Revelation. Uh, that's that's it. And you know, what happens to the Beatitudes? What happens to the greatest commandment, right? <laughs> what happens to turn the other cheek? These are literally dismissed as, yeah, that doesn't apply right now. No, 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 no. You know, you cannot teach a boy to become a strong Christian man by telling him to turn the other cheek. No, no, no. Right. So so it's explicit rejection. So so yes, let's talk about the, you know, overturning the tables of the money changers. But what was Jesus actually doing there? He was going against people who were, were uh, abusing their power, right? And that's where, where Jesus uh, got angry. 
And, you know, the book of Revelation, well, we can bring in some theologians to try to make sense of that. But, you know, the sword was coming out of Jesus' mouth and there's a lot of symbolism there that we can talk about. So let's let's not abandon that, but let's hold it together with the central teachings of Jesus. Get yourself one of those red letter Bibles, spend a little time in it and then come back and see how it fits together. So yeah, there's there's a space for anger and there may be a place for violence, um, but there's also a strong history of Christian pacifism and we need to hold those in tension. Um, Chow wants to ask, uh, how much of the right-leaning cultural expressions of the church that you decry, Kristin, owe to the fact that the left has simply departed the institutional church? Um, yeah, I, I suppose there's maybe a couple of different ways of interpreting that, that question, but, but I guess some people feel like the, the left is sort of there isn't a Christian left anymore. Yeah. Therefore, it's going to be a Christian right, uh, you know, that, that's left behind in that sense. Well, first of all, um, that framing is is um, uh, might be uh, uh, you could argue that perhaps if you're only looking at white Christianity and even then it need to be qualified. Uh, let's keep in mind that we have, you know, a d diverse expressions of Christianity, even just here in the United States. Uh, and so again, let's look at black Protestantism. Are you counting them in the right or in the left, right? How, that's that's really going to uh, mess up our categories. And the black Christian movement has been enormously influential in American culture, society, and politics, right? So so let's 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 place that near the center where it really needs to be, um, and then look at uh, you know progressive Christianity and uh, you know what? How do we make sense of the the Christian left? Um, and then we can talk evangelical left, evangelical left, always there, always on the margins, right? But, you know, if we look at the the rough statistics of 81%, that leaves 19% of white evangelicals who are not in that camp. So we still have, you know, those folks to consider. And then the mainline and, uh, you know, the, the, the Christian left, where what we see is um, you know, other scholars have suggested either that they're completely hopeless, have no influence, or I think a more nuanced understanding is because they don't have this stark differentiation between the religious and the secular, because progressives, progressives tend to embrace the secular, progressive Christians have certainly over the 20th century uh, uh, in American history really shaped the values of just progressivism and the, and the progressive movement. Um, but because you don't have that stark division between sacred and secular, that influence is often obscured. So there are many ways to kind of frame that question. I would say that uh, conservative Christians in America have been much better, more effectively mobilized and uh, in terms of their own uh, religious institutions and also very much in terms of a unified political voice. Hmm. Um Let's maybe at least try to squeeze one more in before we wrap things up. Kristen Michael says uh, the Christianity Today podcast uh, on Mars Hill describes an epidemic of fatherlessness as one of the causes of Mars Hill's growth. Uh, could a more motherly church leader similarly attract people? Um, do you see a psychological need for that? Well, first of all, do do you think that um, and I can't remember exactly how, how that quote was used in the podcast, but that an epidemic of fatherlessness has been behind, you know, the, that that sort of call to masculinity and so on uh, in, in some churches? I really can't speak with authority to that um, because uh, so so I'm a historian and I, I, I tend to stay in that um, in that lane. Um, psychologists will have a lot to, you know, to add to this conversation. I'm, as a historian, always a little skeptical of those claims. And I'd want to see some very clear demographic uh, information. And, um, and, and here too, but even these questions like a mothering church versus a, a masculine church, maybe these categories need to be deconstructed. Maybe we need to think about, um, you know, I don't know, for, for a fatherless child, what kind of community uh, uh, could, could provide a model? What kind of, you know, diverse models of leadership might nurture that young person. So so I guess my response would be, I, I, I'd want to know a lot more about what they're talking about. What I did value about the, um, the podcast, The Rise and Fall of Mars Hill, was Mike Cosper's willingness to explore all kinds of different ways of understanding this situation. You know, I was on there and I provided my my spin and I, ha I have the whole book to describe it, but he, he just played around with all sorts of different angles 
we can look at it this way. We can look at it that way. And I think it's a very rich resource for that, that purpose. Final question. This one's from me, Christine. What, what's the future then for the US church? Obviously, um, one could listen to this podcast, read your book and think, oh, it paints a pretty bleak picture. Yes, um, it does. Has, has, has its witness been irreparably marred, you know, in recent years? What are your predictions maybe immediately? And, and what do you think, what do you think the way forward is as far as you're concerned? Uh, it, I mean, yes, its witness has been marred, and that's particularly affecting, uh, you know, the younger generation. That's where you see, in, ter in terms of survey data, a lot of younger evangelicals leaving, a lot of younger folks just not being drawn into the church. Um, and so that is something of concern to many evangelicals and to many Christian leaders. What I see happening right now is, you know, Ed Setzer has used the terminology, an evangelical reckoning, this kind of soul searching of what, what have we done? And, and where are we at right now? Um, and, and I see that I get letters, several letters every day from evangelicals sharing that, right? Um, and, and, and not just saying, you know, what has happened to me, there's a lot of poignant stories, but how have I in fact been complicit in this? And that's, that's the right question to ask. So that reckoning runs deep and it's happening across American evangelicalism right now. What I don't see happening is evangelical institutions changing course. Not much at all. I see evangelical institutions largely doubling down. Uh, and in many cases, you'll have like these, these voices of protest, people like Beth Moore, people like Russell Moore work hard in these spaces, try to change the direction, and then eventually leave get pushed out and say enough is enough. I'm going to go work in these other spaces. Uh, not that they've left evangelicalism, but they've, they've left their, their institutional homes. And, and that is what I see happening, not just on the national stage, but locally all over the place. So what that means is these people are leaving. Where are they going? I mean, they're looking for, for new homes. Some of them are leaving the church. Some of them are just, I get questions every week. Tell me what church to go to. Where can I find a better spiritual home? But then the institutions that they leave are becoming, if anything, more radicalized because those voices of dissent have said enough. And so those are the dynamics that I see right now. What's in store in the next years? I have no idea. Uh, no idea. I'm a historian. I can talk about what happened. I don't know what's next. What I do know as a historian is often what's next is something unexpected, something we just didn't see coming at all that completely changes the landscape. But I will say that as a historian, I find this moment fascinating because so much mm. is up for grabs right now. It's been fascinating talking to you as well, Kristin, about it. Thank you so much. Thank you for, for being with us for the past hour, for taking lots of different questions and uh, for the book as well. And just a reminder, you can find out more about it by going to Kristin's website, kristindumez.com. That's D-U-M-E-Z. Uh, there is a link from today's show. Also a link to uh, The Unbelievable Show if you want more conversations, uh, not just conversations where I talk to someone one-to-one, -one, but lots of debate and dialogue as well. In fact, we've got some interesting shows coming up debating these sorts of issues in the not too distant future. So, um, but for now, Kristin, thank you very much for being my guest on our live stream Q&A tonight. Oh, thank you. And uh, if you'd like to listen again, you can find this on the Unbelievable podcast. Uh, you can find us uh, every Friday uh, on the Unbelievable show uh, with the podcast, uh, wherever you get your podcast from. And uh, you can find us here on the video channel as well, on our Facebook page, on our YouTube channel. Um, for now, though, thank you very much for being with us. Do find links both to Kristin and the show from today's program. And we will say goodbye and see you next time. Bye bye. <laughs>